Physicists today were left with this intolerable paradox, really, that sometimes light looked like waves, sometimes like particles. And I think it's fair to say that most of them were so upset by this, they swept it under the carpet and said, we won't bother about that. But of course, some people persisted, and through their persistence, modern quantum theory eventually was discovered. The revolution in physics would have to wait for more urgent matters to be resolved. By the end of the Great War, a new generation was now ready to question the established order. Physics was no exception. The catalyst for change was a young French aristocrat, Prince Louis de Broglie. Louis de Broglie was a young student in Paris, and he said, OK, right, he's been found to have this funny behavior. He thought it was waves, but it turns out sometimes it was also particles. Now, there are lots of things around which we've always thought of as being particles, things like electrons and so on. Maybe they sometimes behave like waves. Maybe what's source for the goose is source for the gander. We think we understand particles. We think we know what things like billiard balls are. But when you say no, you have to think of these things as being wavy as well as being particle-like. You have to apply quantum rules to electrons. That was a, a, a really good thing. De Broglie came up with the remarkable idea that everything is a little bit wavy while he was still a student. The theory gave his tutors something of a headache. The Broglie's examiners at the university were reluctant to give him a degree for such a fool idea. He got the degree, all right, but only because Albert Einstein happened to be visiting Paris at the time and said, look, this isn't such a bad idea. Maybe it's even true. Although Einstein championed the idea of wavy electrons, there was no experimental proof. In fact, quite the opposite. J.J. Thompson had got the Nobel Prize for proving it was a particle. But eventually, confirmation of the wavy nature of electrons did come. The key experiments in the 1920s that proved that electrons are waves did so by firing electrons at the regular structure of a crystal, rather like the latticework structure we've got here. And those experiments showed the electrons bending around the atoms of the crystal, just as the waves here are bending around the structure of the here. George Thompson in the 1920s was involved in experiments that showed electrons behaving as waves, doing just the things that ripples on a pond do, being diffracted, interfering with one another, all those kinds of things. And, and the story culminates because J.J. Uh, Thompson's father got the Nobel Prize for proving that electrons are particles, and George Thompson's son got the Nobel Prize for proving that electrons are waves. And they're both right. That's really the core of quantum physics summed up in that. Both of those Nobel Prizes. It was the best of times and the worst of times. They were in the middle of a revolution. They were struggling to come to terms with a problem that still troubles scientists now. Is the electron a particle or a wave? Or both? If you ask, so to speak, if you ask like a wave-like question, no matter how it gave you a wave-like answer, but if you ask a particle-like question, gave you a part of a like answer. It conformed to what you asked it to do. In that sense, there wasn't a direct contradiction. There was obviously a very deep puzzle about how such behavior was possible, but at least there wasn't a flat-on collision. It wasn't at the same time behaving like a bullet and like a spread out flappy thing. It's kind of like putting on two different sets of glasses and seeing the world in two different ways and being able to flip-flop back and forth between those two pictures. Uh, the general public doesn't have that ability, so they really see it as a very weird Alice in Wonderland world and it disturbs them. Frankly, although I may seem very calm, it still disturbs me a bit. The disturbing nature of the electron confounded scientists in the 1920s. The Austrian Erwin Schrödinger set himself the task of writing down an equation that would predict how the wavy electron would behave. In 1926, he succeeded. And in fact, it's a very simple equation. I could uh, write it out on the back of envelope with a great deal of despair. And here, in fact, it is. It simply has uh, two terms in it. On one side of the equation, it's how things change with time. And on the other side of the equation, it says that's related to the energy of the system, which is the fundamental way of describing it. Okay. So there it is. It's a very simple equation. And the whole of atomic and subatomic physics concepts flow from that equation. That shows you something, the wonderful part of mathematics to condense and crystallize out physical truth. Although the behavior of the wavy electron could not be calculated, what no one could predict was that the wavy nature of matter was about to cause a major split in the quantum pioneers.
If electrons were particles, it would be possible to know exactly where they were and how they were moved. Yeah. Isaac Newton's laws of motion, written down in the 17th century, described precisely how particles of any size, from an apple to the moon, behave. The certainty of Newton's world made the Industrial Revolution possible. The motion of anything could be predicted. The most intricate machines could be built. They ran as reliably as clockwork, just as Newton imagined the whole universe to work. It seemed unquestionable that nature was utterly predictable. Newton's equations tell you exactly what's going to happen in the future. It turned out that the quantum world, the small scale world, is different from there. It's uh, unpicturable to us, it's cloudy in its character, and it's probabilistic, meaning that we can't say for certain what's going to happen. If this may happen, that may happen. We can say what the chances are. But that's as far as we can go. The man who first realized the world runs on quantum chance was Werner Heisenberg. In 1927, he proposed the uncertainty principle. It states that because matter is spread out in space, wait, it's impossible to say exactly where it is and what it might do next simultaneously. This is absolutely real down in the depths of quantum physics. An electron itself does not know where it is and where it's going. So we can never be certain about what's happening inside matter. The effects are so small in our everyday world, we never see them. But the fact that at its heart, nature is a game of chance, meant scientists had to concede there was a real limit to what they could know with certainty. For many, this was unacceptable. Several of the quantum pioneers didn't like what they'd invented. Um, Max Planck wasn't really happy with it. Uh, Einstein wasn't happy with it. Schrodinger wasn't happy with it. And Einstein hated the idea that the outcomes of experiments could not be completely predictable. Uh, and in the, the famous expression, it's usually quoted, that he, he said, um, that I cannot believe that God plays dice with the universe. And he thought that meant that the physical world had to be absolutely objective, had to be absolutely determinate and clear and certain. Of course, quantum mechanics wasn't like that. And so he came to, to hate his grandchild. From across Europe, the greatest minds of the age came together to settle the matter of uncertainty. The place was Solvay in Belgium, the year 1927. The single photograph that remains of the continent oh, shows a unique hats. collection of scientific I feel a storm is coming. Max Planck Get is next to Marie Curie. Behind Einstein are the other great doubters of uncertainty, like Prince Louis de Bruyne, the original proposer of the wave theory. And on the top row, Erwin Schrödinger, whose equation made mathematical sense of waving matter. Schrödinger and the others were not willing to take the leap into uncertainty with the young Turks, Pyro and Heisenberg. They said, you've got to go with the physics, that's the way the world is, you can't quarrel with that. And there's some quite sharp arguments and discussions between Einstein and Bohr on the one hand, and between people like the boy and um, a very sharp tongue, um, Swiss uh, physicist uh, Wolfgang Pauli, who essentially told uh, the boy that he was shut up because he was stupid. And the boy was a sensitive person that didn't like that, but he actually went away and he shot so it was a sort of it was a sort of turning point moment in which the young turns won out over the old god. We couldn't believe that the outcome of the experiment depended on chance. And that's what led Einstein for the last 20 years or more of his life to, to fight this more or less lone battle against the theory that was taking physics by storm and try to find flaws in it. And he kept trying to invent experiments, thought experiments, imaginary experiments that would prove that quantum physics could be true. And every time he did, people found ways around his thought experiments and found that they didn't prove them at all. And ultimately, perhaps just as well for him, after he died, people actually did some of these experiments for real, and every time they found quantum physics is right, probability rules. I feel a storm is coming. By the late 1930s, quantum theory had found a new one, as European scientists sought sanctuary from Nazi oppression. So there was this huge shift of, of science to America. You have this rich country uh, and you have this ability to, to apply uh, massive technology and money to fundamental problems. 
But Americans, by and large, have taken quantum mechanics as a very useful tool. And so that don't bother me with all these philosophical arguments. I just want to be able to make calculations. And that's where our strength is. We have taken this pragmatic viewpoint and ignored what are some public aspects. If we really sat down and thought about the philosophical meaning of what we were working with, we might not get anything done. I have no weakness. The company that had already made a fortune from knowing the electron was a particle, but by now exploring the commercial potential of the wave theory of electrons. Bell Laboratories began a research program in the 1930s to investigate possible solid state physics alternatives to the vacuum tube. Of course, we cannot build a calculating machine as flexible as the human brain. But even a man made computer designed to do hundreds of brain like calculating jobs might need an Empire State Building to house it and a Niagara Falls to power and cool it if vacuum tubes were used in its construction. Vacuum tubes were powerful. Vacuum tubes gave off a lot of heat, which had to be handled. Vacuum tubes wore out and had to be replaced. The goal was to replace the unreliable glass vacuum tubes with tiny solid devices that didn't need a vacuum to work. Scientists already had a good idea of how electrons moved inside a vacuum. They behaved like particles. These aroused monkeys throwing pebbles at a target through a shutter ably portray what goes on in a vacuum tube. Nothing! But inside a solid, a crystal, the electrons behave like waves, spreading out and bending around the storm is coming. To make Get electrons ready. work on a solid, you need to know about quantum mechanics. Let's go! And because electrons not only particles, but also waves, the waves are spread out. Then the electron wave sample the overall structure of the crystal, just as the particle-like aspect of the electron carries the unit of electric charge. So in a curious way, the particle wave duality of electrons is essential. Both aspects of it are essential for understanding how electrons behave in solids and therefore how the electronics work. In the early 1930s, solid materials were already being used in electrical circuits to detect radio. These solids were called semiconductors because they conduct just a little bit of electricity. Using quantum theory, for the first time, the scientists could control the flow of electricity with precision. In the 1940s, this led to the development of semiconductor technology as a vital war weapon. Semiconductor radar could detect very small features like the conning tower of a submarine. It was this technology that Bell Labs used just after the war to create the model of their tracks. The transistor was the semiconductor device that could amplify electrical signals, just like the vacuum tube, only better. The tiny transistor was the result of over 10 years hard work at Bell Labs applying quantum theory to solve a practical problems. The head of the department was William Shockley. The two key players in the transistor story, along with Shockley, are John Bardeen, theoretical physicist, and Walter Bratton, an experimental physicist. On December 16th of 1947, they succeeded for the first time in amplifying the electrical signal for the solid state device. A few days later, on December 23rd, they demonstrated their device to the department head shop and to a group of other Bell Lab scientists. And the transistor was born. But it was a lot of hard work, a lot of brilliance on the part of the scientists involved. It was not, oh, what are you going to do at the office today? Oh, dear, I'm going to go to the office and invent a transistor. A lot harder. The payoff was enormous. Through their efforts, you may be able to get music with a flick of your wrist from the so called Dick Tracy radio. The miniaturization made possible by semiconductors laid the foundation for a new electronics industry. The first transistor took over 10 years to manage. Today, 10,000 times more transistors than the population of the Earth are made every day. They're shrunk down to access the pumps and valves that drive electrons around microchips. 
It all depends on quantum mechanics and the strange wave-particle nature of the electron. Over a hundred years after its discovery, we can actually see what an electron might look like by using the computer technology it created. One of the neatest pictures that sums up the quantum world is, is the one where a, a ring of atoms has been made as, as a little fence. You can see the waves of, of what used to be thought of as quantum particles sort of filling this quantum corral, as it's called. They can't escape. Uh, they're stuck inside there, and the waviness is kind of frozen there and can be photographed. Um, that's something that the, the quantum pioneers would love to see. Schrodinger would have said, way cool. Don Eigler of IBM has used a quantum microscope to make pictures of atomic surfaces. Each step in this picture of a surface is just one atom high. On top of the atom, the wavy pattern is caused by a sea of electrons. These are just electrons which are, are trapped in the surface layer. But within the surface layer, they're trying to move around. These electrons are waiting. And the waves, um, when they move, they sometimes bang into features on the surface, like step edges or uh, individual atoms which might be sticking out of the surface. And when the wave uh, bangs into something, it reflects off the of that. When you have a uh, reflected wave atom together, the part of the wave, it sets up what we call a standing wave. These are regions where there are large oscillations which are, are fixed where they are. regions where oscillations are Prepare! I've always felt that the wave function was just a description of reality. And the reality was deeper it was the particle. And the wave function was something mathematical up in the physicist's head. To actually see a physical wave function rippling across the surface is rather disturbing. If I was really honest, I'd certainly have to tell you that I need to go back and reassess the way I pictured the world. Well, I'm, I'm probably somewhere in error, or maybe I'm just a heretic. I don't believe in this way particle throughout mumbo jumbo. I think it's mostly just um, the leftover baggage of, of having started off understanding the world in terms of particles and then being forced because of the quantum evolution to the world and to these uh, ways of constructing this realistic way of, of looking at very small particles. You don't even think about them as particles. Electrons are waves. And if you think of them in terms of them, you will always end up with the right answer. Always. The great debate on the nature of the electron and the meaning of the quantum world lingers on the The success of quantum theory is unquestionable, but its meaning remains for each one of us to understand on our own account. People sometimes say that quantum cash shows that God plays dice. I don't think that's quite right thinking about it. What I think we should say about it is that the universe is not God's puppet yet. It isn't under tight divine control. It's allowed in some sense to be itself and restore itself. And perhaps the openness of quantum theory, the unpredictability of quantum theory, is at the level of atoms and there, an expression of an openness which I think is in the universe all over. People have a, a kind of a, a deep religious need to, to know the truth about the universe, to know how the universe works. That's why they're fascinated by black holes. And quantum mechanics is the most mysterious and exciting part of physics, uh, and so it touches that chord. So it's not just the physics, it's this sort of mystic experience of knowing about ultimate truth, and that's the appeal.
This won't take long. Enough! Get ready, fight! yourself out.
This won't take long. Get ready, fight! Jeez. 